Local programming on KRWG made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Welcome to Your Legislators, a production of KRWG Broadcasting. Your Legislators is a public service program providing our viewing audience in southern New Mexico the opportunity to hear about important legislative issues directly from their elected representatives in Santa Fe. Thank you for joining us for Your Legislators. I'm Fred Martino. We're pleased to have with us this week from Santa Fe, Senator Bill Burt. Senator, it's great to have you with us. Fred, thank you very much. I, I appreciate the invitation. Glad to be here. Well, it's good to have you here. You know, I know that the big job for the legislature is getting a budget together, and this has been a very interesting session for that with two <laughs> very different approaches, uh, a really sweeping reform uh, that Republicans have uh, proposed to lower the uh, gross receipts tax uh, and get rid of a lot of uh, exemptions. And then there's another approach that uh, largely Democrats have been pushing uh, that is not a sweeping reform, but does have a number of ways to increase revenue to ensure that the budget would be balanced. But it's not clear the governor would, would accept that approach. Give us a sense uh, right now of the challenge in coming up with a budget and where you see this going. Well, and thanks, Fred. Uh, that is the challenge in this particular session. You are absolutely correct. I will tell you that uh, uh, just as a point of reference, what typically happens is the House generates the budget uh, and they send it over to the Senate and then the Senate uh, either concurs or does adjustment on it. And uh, we either send it back to the House for concurrence or send it to the governor at that time. That's the simple process. and. This year it has been uh, pretty much anything but simple, uh, simply because our revenues are so dramatically down. Uh, we've been saying for a year and a half that we need to be very much aware of the financial situation that we are in. So here's where we are as best I can tell today. Um, there are three primary bills that we're looking at. First off, HB2, House Bill 2, is the basic budget. Uh, that was built by the House and has been sent over to the Senate. HB 202 is the supplemental bill that has some uh, revenue generating or taxation, if you will, uh, in it that will help feed the cost of the budget. And finally, uh, uh, what I consider uh, a great piece of legislation in general, needs some tweaking, but is a great first step, is HB 412. Uh, House Bill 412 uh, is, is a two-year-plus project for Representative Jason Harper. Um, he has worked on revamping the entire tax code of the state of New Mexico. And I, for one, think that is at the crux of m much of our uh, budgetary problems right now is the current tax code of the state of New Mexico. So this bill that is over uh, somewhere around 350, 370 pages, uh, is very comprehensive. He spent two years working on this, talking to many, many consultants uh, about how to uh, restructure the, the tax code, what other states are doing, what, what makes sense today. And so uh, HB 412, which is again the tax bill, will play into the way that we somewhat build the budget. Uh, and and I'm, I'm giving you as much background as I possibly can because I'd like the people to really understand how difficult this process is. Uh, so the, um, the tax bill has a tremendous impact on us long term because it will eliminate over 100 uh, waivers and, and uh, uh, discounts that have been added to the tax code over the many, many years for, for different functions, gas, uh, GRT, uh, supplemental, uh, uh, or, or not supplemental, but uh, GRT waivers, if you will for uh, industry, industries and other economic uh, generating areas in the state that hopefully bring economic growth into the state. Yeah, so basically creating a, a sales tax uh, in, instead of a GRT, reducing the rate, but getting rid of a lot of exemptions. And as you know, the big hitch in getting this done, it seemed, was the fact that it would also bring the tax back onto groceries. But as I understand it, 
uh, that hurdle has been uh, taken care of. Is that right? Well, there is in, in 412, again, the tax bill, uh, there is uh, tax put on f uh, back on food, uh, but it is at a much lower rate uh, because that is probably one of the biggest generators in the state of New Mexico, certainly for local economies. And uh, since the uh, uh, food on tax was taken away, uh, quite frankly, municipalities and counties throughout New Mexico have struggled uh, to recoup that funding because they relied on it so much and it was a, a significant portion of their annual budget. But is that a deal breaker? I mean, in other words, uh, in, this, in this plan, uh, to put the tax back on groceries, would, would that uh, quelch getting this passed in, uh, by not only uh, Democrats in the legislature, but, but perhaps by the governor? Well, uh, what we're trying to do, and this is, this is where all of this kind of comes together and what's going on right now is we're having uh, discussions uh, with the governor, with the administration, we're having uh, discussions with the uh, Legislative Finance Council, uh, and that is, those are the economic folks that uh, do a lot of research and, and recommend to the, uh, the legislature as to what way we should go economically and budget-wise. And then there's uh, FDA, which is uh, the, um, excuse me, DFA, the uh, Department of uh, Financial Authority. And that is, are all the financial folks who do all the research, evaluation, analyze, and, uh, and talk with the governor and the administration about which direction we should go. So all of these entities now are coming to the table and we're having very frank discussions about the budget, how we can, how we can attain the budget that we need to make the state of New Mexico operate, and how are we going to fund that to, to make that happen. And as a final note, I will say, that, that what we're going to do in the next year or two uh, will be kind of a, a stopgap uh, process to get us to the point where if uh, HB 412, the tax code revamp, uh, should go through, uh, we will have probably 18 months to two and a half years to uh, put the code into effect. And so we need funding sources in between to make that happen. So there may be some short-term uh, elimination of some tax breaks. Uh, there may be some short-term movement of money from one uh, fund to another fund to get us to that point to where the new tax code theoretically could, could take off and uh, then we would be off and running uh, generating enough money in the state to operate the state. Okay. And also very important uh, to replenish our reserves. Okay, so let's get to uh, generating uh, money in, in the state. There are some other proposals I wanted to ask you about. As you know, Senator John Arthur Smith has proposed a 10 cent a gallon increase in the state's gas tax. We have one of the lowest uh, gas taxes in the country and it hasn't been increased to keep up with the inflationary uh, cost of roads and other infrastructure. What do you make of this? Uh, as a matter of fact, that bill was passed out of the Senate a couple of days ago, uh, and uh, I, I uh, understand the need for the additional tax. Uh, however, my concern was we have a budgetary pro problem in the state right now. Uh, I voted against that particular bill simply because I believe that the money that we generate right now should go to the general fund to take care of of the budgetary problem that we have right now. And then if we want to look at two or three years down the road, once we kind of get back on track uh, budgetarily, if we want to designate that money to go to roads, which uh, I believe we need desperate work on the roads. I uh, travel a lot of highways and uh, byways around the state of New Mexico each and every year. And uh, we have some serious problems out there. So yes, we need to, to refund roads. Uh, but this particular bill that John Arthur Smith uh, put forth, uh, my, my, my primary concern with that is it was the funds were misdirected and that's why I voted against it. Okay, I wanna ask you also about alcohol and tobacco taxes. Uh, there was a success in uh, moving forward on an increase in the state's tax on uh, cigarettes by a uh, dollar fifty uh, a pack. Uh, polls show that these taxes are very popular with the public as you know and uh, public policy experts also say that they're a good idea because they help recoup the the cost that the substances present to government. What are your thoughts? 
Well, again, uh, uh, Howie Morales, Senator Howie Morales uh, from the Grant County Silver City area ran this bill. And, and unfortunately for me, again, uh, I'm not opposed to uh, necessarily the tax on the uh, on cigarettes. I, I thought, number one, it was uh, a little much. A dollar fifty. I mean, it almost doubles the tax on cigarettes at this point in time. But more importantly, that money was redesignated to go to education specifically and not to the general fund. And here we are again with a budget problem, uh, probably a 250 to 300 million dollar shortfall, and we're sending money specifically to different agencies and to different uh, areas within the state. In my opinion, rather to the general fund, where it needs to be at least. Uh, for the next couple of years to get us out of this budget crunch. So I, I kind of had the same problem with uh, this particular bill that Senator Morales ran uh, as I did with the one that uh, Senator John Arthur ran. Uh, as you know, there uh, were a lot of different moves to uh, legalize tax and regulate cannabis. Uh, proponents said this was a, a good way for the state to raise revenue. What are your thoughts about that? Well, uh, again, for clarification, uh, two areas. Uh, a lot of people want to uh, decriminalize or legalize marijuana and, and uh, use of marijuana in the state of New Mexico. I oppose that. Uh, this is a state that can't even get a handle on our drinking problem, DWIs. Uh, as many rules and regulations as we, as we have put on the books, we can't seem to uh, get a handle on how we handle DWI. Now, you're, if, if you decriminalize or legalize the use of marijuana, you're adding yet another layer to the problem that our police forces across the state already have. And our police forces are strapped as it is. They have about uh, anywhere from 12 to 25 percent uh, uh, shortfall in their uh, uh, total number of employees, their patrolmen, and so on and so forth. And uh, it just adds an additional burden onto what we do. Now, uh, with that said, the other discussion that we have had, and I am in favor of this, is looking at uh, growing hemp in the state of New Mexico. And I, before everybody uh, jumps to that and says, oh my goodness, growing marijuana, that is not what I'm talking about. There are hemp plants Hemp is used in clothing, in a lot of electronics. It's used in, in uh, uh, a myriad of, of uh, processes and, and, and uh, items that we use in our everyday life. And we have to import all of it. It is a, a huge cash crop. Uh, it does not generate uh, hemp plants, uh, use uh, uh, very little water comparatively to many crops. Uh, and it uh, is, is a great cash crop. Uh, the agricultural department seems to be very interested in uh, looking at using this. And as you know, uh, Senator Burt, this is overwhelmingly, in a bipartisan fashion, passed the legislature twice, uh, including this session, and twice it was vetoed by the governor. Uh, any hopes yes. for uh, overriding that veto or coming up with uh, another bill that's not as flexible? I know there is another bill that's not as flexible that uh, we don't know yet at this point taping this program. We don't know yet if that would avoid the veto pen. Well, I, I certainly can't speak for the governor. I, I don't know uh, what her plans are and what she would and would not do. Uh, I think as she grows in her uh, processes uh, as governor, uh, she evolves and, and there may be uh, doors open. I think it would depend on the specific piece of legislation. Uh, Senator Cisco McSorley has uh, gotten to her desk, I believe, a uh, piece of legislation that would allow uh, commercial, not commercial production of hemp, but research on hemp on how to do it, how it would be uh, used within the state, how it would be grown within the state. And so we're taking a, a measured approach to putting uh, uh, the possibility of hemp production in the state. And this would have a lot to do with uh, a lot of uh, research done uh, specifically by uh, our, the Agriculture Department at New Mexico State University. Okay, and we should note that we have invited Governor Martinez to join us on this program and hope to have her on this show or another show in the future. There was another uh, issue of, a, yes, another issue of a veto uh, the governor made this week. Uh, this was on a bill uh, that dealt with, uh, in fact, introduced by a, a number of your Republican uh, colleagues that would prevent uh, teacher evaluations 
uh, from being dinged when teachers use uh, their sick leave. And uh, this, this again, overwhelmingly passed in a bipartisan fashion, was vetoed uh, by the governor. And one of your Republican uh, colleagues, uh, Craig Brandt, is saying that he's going to pursue an override of that veto. Tell us your thoughts on this. Well, and I haven't talked to Senator Brandt uh, uh, to find out his thoughts on this. Uh, we all thought that that was a very fair piece of legislation. Um, and again, I can't speak for the governor, uh, so I don't know her thought processes. I do know that she is, is very much in support of uh, her Secretary of Education, Hannah Scandera. And uh, I think that uh, uh, I don't want to put words in people's mouths, but I'm sure there's some conversation going on between the two. And uh, they may have decided that that is not the way that they want to go on the teacher evaluations. And that's maybe why she vetoed the bill. Do you think Again, there should be an override? Her, but that would be my thought. Yeah, do, you think sorry, should, do you think there should be an override on this, overriding this veto? Uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, uh, I don't think this is a... I think it's an important piece of legislation, but I, I don't know if it's uh, big enough for it to be brought back to the floor of the Senate or back to the floor of the House and to work on a veto or override of that. Uh, I think this is something that may even be able to be worked out <clears throat> within, uh, uh, within some more discussion or with the Department of Education and maybe rolling the governor into those discussions. To, to bring that this particular issue back to the floor for an override, I'm, I'm not sure that is the direction that we want to go. Okay, want to get to the minimum wage. As you know, a number of different proposals out there. It seems that there's a lot of support for a proposal that would increase the minimum wage to $9 uh, an hour. Uh, where do you stand on this and where do you think this is going? Well, uh, two things. Uh, it's been a long time since we've had a, any kind of increase in uh, minimum wage. Uh, for me personally, I believe that is more of a federal law that needs to be done because right now in the state of New Mexico, we have certain communities or municipalities that have a higher wage than smaller communities. So if a smaller community can't pay the same wage on uh, uh, to work at McDonald's or wherever the case may be, uh, people may gravitate to the larger markets and that doesn't help the small markets where we also need a lot of employees and folks to run businesses. Uh, secondly, uh, $9, eight, eight fifty to $9 uh, seems to me in, in general terms to be a measured uh, increase. Uh, again, I would like to see more of a federal input on that. I think that we also have to remind ourselves that Minimum wage was never meant to be a living wage. And I think we get that confused sometimes. Minimum wage was a starter wage for people to get into a career or get into a job and then through the attributes that they bring to the table, uh, be able to move up the ladder and get uh, increases in their pay because of the good work that they do. And, you and people, look, people look now today at minimum wage as a living wage and, and I don't think that is the right way to go on that. Okay, and you have a connection uh, to this in, in another way, not just as a legislator, because you're a business owner. You own a number yes. of radio stations in Alamogordo. Uh, this was an interesting uh, year with the legislative session with some of these minimum wage proposals because uh, there was support uh, among some chambers of commerce uh, for the increase to $9 an hour. Uh, and, and I want to get your sense of that because I, I'm sure that's not, even though th that there may be some support from some chambers of commerce, that doesn't necessarily mean that there's universal support in the business community right. for this. Right, right. I, I, my sense is, and I, I will tell you that in Alamogordo, uh, Mike Espiritu, who is not only our chamber director, but also our director of economic development for our community, uh, and has been in that position probably eight, ten years at least, uh, is doing a great job for us. Uh, we talked uh, yesterday a little bit, and uh, the actual board uh, for the Chamber of Commerce uh, for Alamogordo has not put out any uh, official word as to whether or not they support 
uh, higher wages or at what rate they would like that higher wage to be. So uh, with regards to Alamogordo, uh, I, I couldn't answer that with regards to what the official word is, but I do know that most businesses, because as you mentioned, I own radio stations and we make our living through advertising, so we work with a lot of wonderful people in Alamogordo who own businesses or manage businesses, and I think the general tone for most of those folks is that the, the minimum wage probably should go up, but we get varying degrees of how high it should go up, should there be a, a, a starter wage so that people come in and work for a specific rate for, I don't know, 30, 60, 90 days, and then once they have proven themselves, then go to the normal minimum wage, whatever that may be. Uh, we've had a lot of discussions about that. Uh, so I don't think I have any firm direction from uh, either Otero, Lincoln, or Chavez counties, but I do know that they don't want the minimum wage to go up in rural New Mexico to the point where uh, they're going to have to readjust the way they run their businesses, and the last thing that they want to do in rural New Mexico is to lay people off. Okay, and uh, getting to another business issue, I wanted to make time for this because this is one area where there was uh, something passed and, and not vetoed, investments in broadband internet in the state. What are your thoughts? Well, I will tell you, I, I uh, have uh, spent, I think, about four years on science and technology, and this all came out of that particular interim committee meeting. And I will tell you that uh, uh, I think there's broad support, no pun intended, broad support for broadbanding all across the state of New Mexico and certainly here in the uh, legislature. Uh, we've spent uh, a lot of time working with the telecom companies in the state from CenturyLink all the way down to the, to the rural and, and uh, smaller companies, uh, trying to work with them to see what would be the best plan to do to come up with an idea of expanding broadband and, and getting to what we call the last mile, that, that last mile that will connect a, a rural household out there somewhere with broadbanding. You can't just do it with satellite. You can't just do it with wireless. Uh, somewhere along the line, you actually have to have a cable, uh, you know, get to that house some way, and that's a very expensive proposition. So I think you see great support for this. How we continue to fund that and work with uh, companies to make that happen uh, will be an ongoing process. Okay, I want to ask you, we're quickly running out of time, I want to ask you about another issue that's come up quite a bit uh, over the years in New Mexico, and that, are, that is the notion of an ethics commission. Uh, the House has passed a bill that would send this to voters next year. Uh, where do you stand on this? Uh, you know, for me, and, and, and we're all so different, there are 112 legislators and we have different backgrounds, we are brought up diff differently. For me, it is, it, it is a natural thing to do things the right way. Uh, I, I hope that everyone in this roundhouse uh, was taught some morals, some ethics when they were growing up, and I hope that they are applying them to everything they do, not just their work here in the legislature, but the way they lead their life, the way they, they, they treat their spouse, uh, how they choose their friends, and, and, and how they run their life. Uh, paying taxes, the whole nine yards. Uh, with that said, uh, you know, guidelines oftentimes are uh, designed to help give some direction and some formation and some, some parameters with which to work in. Uh, so I, I would like to see what the proposal is. I would like to see what uh, a commission would really look like, what the power would be that they would have. Uh, before I make any firm decision on that. But I would like to see uh, to make sure that, you know, our, 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 there have been very few isolated instances of problems with ethics in the legislature. But there the ones that have happened have been pretty dramatic and, and of significant size. Uh, once in a while, I think we need to take individuals to the side and say, uh, you know, I think what you're doing here is wrong. You need to reevaluate what you're doing and think about what you're doing. And okay. I think a lot of times as, as uh, legislators, we can do that without form, structure, and maybe laws uh, okay. to make that happen. Separate and apart from an ethics commission, another question I have for you as part of ethics, do you believe there should be legislation to look at a requirement of two years or more before state officials go to work for organizations that lobby for the government. As you know, former uh, New Mexico Environment Department leader Ryan Flynn 
uh, left the yes. Martinez administration and then became uh, director of the New Mexico Oil and Gas Association. What are your thoughts on this? Um, well, I, I, you know, I, I've gone over this quite a bit in my mind, so I'm trying to think if Ryan, who I think, by the way, was a, a wonderful environmental secretary uh, because he had great balance in his approach to the environment in the state of New Mexico, if, and I'm not just talking about him, but anyone who segues out of a government job into a lobbying job, um, I, you know, at face value, I just don't see a big problem with that. I don't understand why someone can't go from one job to another. The reason they're hired is because they bring a, a certain uh, level of expertise to that job. Uh, there aren't any secrets uh, that they're going to bring because uh, government is pretty open as best we possibly can make it, and it, it continues to, to we continue to add levels of uh, of uh, openness uh, and and transparency to what we do. Well, and, and, so and at Senator face Byrd, value, I don't I don't uh, see a Sen problem with that. And Senator Byrd, I, we should note that uh, in terms of leaders of organizations. Uh, legislation may not even apply to them because they may not be a registered lobbyist. Their organization may lobby, but they may not lobby. But I want to get, get beyond that specific instance. I want to get your opinion on this, this overall idea that is there a danger that if someone is regulating an industry, and then they leave that job to go to work for that industry, that there might be a conflict of interest there, that uh, it, it might lead to, to, to problems. Uh, we, we may never, never know if it was quid pro quo, so to speak, but it may lead to the conflict of interest, and certainly some would argue an appearance of a conflict of interest. So, I, and maybe I'm not totally understanding the question, but are you saying that, uh, say, uh, the Secretary of Environment is now going to an oil company and telling the oil company how to circumvent procedures well, or policies? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about any specific situation, but in general, uh, having that, that two-year cooling off period, if you will, would avoid the, the notion that someone uh, is getting a job uh, for being favorable in their regulatory responsibilities. So uh, I guess one of the questions that I would ask is, what happens in that two-year period from the time they leave the environmental department before they go to work for, say, oil and gas or agriculture department or, or a farmer or whatever? What, what happens in that two years? What makes that difference in two years? Okay, all right, well, Senator Burt, we really appreciate you joining us today. <laughs> We've run out of time and, and uh, we wish you luck in the remaining week of the session. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fred. Appreciate your uh, invitation. Glad to be here. All right. And thank you at home for joining us for your legislators. We'll see you next week.